Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Gilles Gardam from uh, uh, Münster University. Uh, he will uh, talk about the Kaplansky conjectures, and Gilles has made uh, kindly available for us to follow back uh, his slides. So you can, if you click on the chat, uh, you see the link to his uh, web page, and then uh, you can have uh, uh, the slides available uh, while uh, he's talking. Thank you. Thank you, Gilles. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so thanks for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'll talk about Koplansky's conjectures. Before I get started, just a quick, um, I guess, word of uh, self-promotion. Uh, I'm talking about conjectures, and one of them I've recently found a counterexample to, and finding that counterexample was something that involved computation. Um, and I'll be giving a talk on the computational side of this story um, in a bit more than uh, two weeks uh, in a talk sort of virtually in Sydney. So uh, if you're interested in hearing about the computational side, then come along to that. Uh, I've put five in scare quotes because depending on in which part of the Americas you are, it might actually be on the 4th of October. Um, so that's an upcoming talk, but today I just want to talk about the mathematical side of things and not really get stuck into the nitty gritty computational stuff. Uh, okay. So, um, so I'm a group theorist, my training's in geometric group theory, um, but I wanted to start with something a bit more operator algebraic because I think this may be something that's closer to the interests of some of you. Um, if that's not the case, then you can just ignore this slide, but I'm setting up sort of the link to some more operator algebraic stuff. So this is not my area of expertise, but anyway, yeah, here goes. So there's a conjecture on group C star algebra is called the Kattison Kaplansky conjecture. And it's a really appealingly simple statement. It just says that we take a torsion-free discrete group G and then it's reduced group C star algebra has no idempotence other than zero and one. Okay, so idempotent just means something that squares to itself. And uh, we learned in high school how to solve X squared equals X to find solutions zero and one. And the conjecture says that there's nothing beyond that living inside the reduced group C star algebra. So this is an, an algebraic statement. If you prefer to think of um, group C star algebras as something analytic, then an alternative formulation is to say um, that the spectrum of every element is connected. And so going between these two statements is um, an application of holomorphic functional calculus. Uh, and it's also equivalent to saying that the canonical trace only takes integer values on item potents. Um, so just a quick um, observation that we really need to assume the group's torsion free. If it's not, and say we've got some element G of order N, or just any element G whose nth power is the identity in the group, then we can just take the, the average of, of those elements, uh, one G up to G to the N minus one, and that's an item potent. So basically everything I'll talk about today will be for torsion free groups. I'll talk about some conjectures which make sense and are open for groups where we allow torsion elements as well, but mostly I'll be interested in things where there's no torsion, so no elements of finite order in the group. Okay, so sort of the, the first, um, I guess, big breakthrough on, on this conjecture was Pimsner and Voiculescu's proof for free groups in 1980. And after that, it was realized that in, in fact, this is a consequence of the Baumkorn conjecture. And this is sort of the, the big uh, collection of groups for which we know that the conjecture is true. So in fact, um, yeah, Baumkorn is about so this, uh, the assembly maps and isomorphism. And to get the uh, Kattis and Kaplansky conjecture, we just need that it's uh, subjective. Okay, so this all is sort of um, C star algebraic stuff, but we can restrict our focus just to the complex group algebra, CG, sitting inside uh, the C star algebra. And the conjecture is still wide open. So admittedly, it does make it easier if we are only asking about the complex group algebra and not it's the reduced group C star algebra. There are 
more tools to prove the conjecture in that case. But it certainly doesn't make it easy in the sense that it's now something that we can just settle. It's still, in general, completely open. And we can play the same game with any other coefficients. So we could replace the complex numbers with some field k and ask again, are all of the item totems in that group ring or group algebra? If you, I mean, uh, I guess sometimes people prefer to say group algebra, so I'll just say group ring, but I mean the same thing. Um, does the group ring have only zero and one, the trivial item potents as item potents? Okay. So this conjecture is, is wide open. It's, it's a hard question. And of course, something we do when we have hard questions that we don't know to answer is we just ask even harder questions. And there are some conjectures that strengthen this, um, which are commonly attributed to Kaplansky. So often one, one refers to the um, you know, Caddis and Kaplansky item burden conjecture, or if we only care about group algebras, the Kaplansky item burden conjecture. There's two other conjectures carrying Kaplansky's name the zero divisor and the item potent conjecture. Um, in fact, both of them are actually formulated by Higman in his thesis in 1940. Uh, so they certainly have a long history, um, but it was really Kaplansky who popularized the questions and indeed the study of, of group rings. So it's, it's still fair that they carry his name, even though hidden on the shelves in Oxford is a PhD thesis formulating these questions um, from a bit before Kaplansky's time. Okay. So these stronger conjectures have the same sort of form as the item potent conjecture that just ruling out certain elements in the group ring. So the statement is let G be a torsion free group and K be some field, then we consider the group ring KG. And the zero divisor conjecture says that it has no zero divisors or Maybe I should say no non-zero zero divisors in case you consider zero to be a zero divisor itself. So spelling that out, it just says if I take two elements A and B in the group ring, the multiply to give zero, then at least one of them has to be zero itself. Okay. And the unit conjecture is saying that the only units are trivial units. So there's always a, a bunch of units hanging around in a group ring. Right? So my the elements of my group ring are a formal k-linear sums of group elements. And if I have a sum which is just a single group element multiplied by a single field element, then that's a unit because its inverse is just what I get by taking the inverse of the field element times the inverse of the group element. So K inverse times G inverse. Um, so they're the, these sort of trivial units that we always have lying around. And the unit conjecture says that the trivial units are, in fact, all of the units that we find in the group ring. So, Unlike um, the item product conjecture, it doesn't make sense to ask these questions for group C star algebras. They just um, seem to be false very quickly by functional calculus because they've got this extra freedom in, in picking two, uh, two elements or two functions. So those are these stronger conjectures and zero divisor conjecture is wide open. The unit conjecture we now know um, as of my paper from this year uh, that it's false at least in positive characteristic. So now I'd like to take a couple of minutes to, to make some sort of observations about the role that characteristic plays. Um, OK, so there are some situations where we can move back and forth between positive characteristic and zero characteristic. So I guess there are a few ways to think about this. One way I'd like to, I'd like to formulate it is in terms of um, ultra products. So suppose we have a non-principal ultra filter on uh, the set of primes, then we can actually realize the complex numbers as an ultra product of algebraic closures of FP. Okay, so uh, if this sort of seems like gobbledygook, don't worry, um, it's not really gonna be essential. Um, but our ultra filter is basically a way of um, applying democracy to an infinite set. We ask every prime whether they think a statement is true or false, and we get an answer. Um, they take some sort of vote, and we can always decide whether, in some sense, almost all 
primes say yes or almost all primes say no. And this ultra product is the direct product of all those fields. This is some huge ring. And then we mod out by things which are almost always, according to the ultra filter, equal to zero. Okay, so this is just a sort of model theoretic um, gadget, if you like. Um, so what does this tell us for the Kaplansky conjectures? Well, if we could prove one of the conjectures for all finite fields, so, um, well, the first observation is we would then have it for the algebraic closure of FP. Why? Because that's just a union of all the uh, finite fields of characteristic P. And the conjecture is just an existential statement about the field. Right? So it's talking about the group ring. Um, and okay, I can have sort of arbitrarily large support of my elements, but the support of my elements in the group ring is always finite. So once I fix some support that I allow, the conjecture just becomes a statement about some finite set of, um, of field elements. And so being something that's purely existential, if I know it for um, uh, yeah, purely existential statement about finitely many elements, if I know that for um, all finite fields and I get that for the algebraic closure and then passing to this ultra product, I then get it for C. Okay. Um, if the argument is, if I haven't done a good job of explaining that, then uh, I'm sorry, but I, I hope you can just believe the conclusion that if we can prove something for all finite fields, we get it for C. So even if we say, um, you know, I, if you say, I really only think C is the only legitimate field to work over, characteristic zero is the best, there's still some reason why you should care about these statements over finite fields. At least that's what I'm trying to argue. Okay. Going the other way is a little bit more subtle. If we could disprove the conjecture for all finite fields, we don't necessarily get a counterexample over C. We need some additional you know, sort of finiteness assumption so that we can use this trick. Namely, we need that the counterexamples have got uniformly bounded support. Okay. All right. So that's all I wanted to say on that. Um, finite characteristic fields are somehow relevant, even if we only care, oh, sorry, finite fields are relevant, even if we only care about characteristic zero, potentially. So um, general sort of word of warning is that the Kaplansky conjectures the statements which ostensibly apply to all groups. And whenever, like, at least to all torsion free groups. Maybe we say torsion free groups are pretty close to being all groups uh, in some moral sense. And when we make a statement that's claiming to be true for all groups, or all countable groups, or all torsion free groups, we have to keep in mind this sort of um, guiding philosophy. Uh, due to Gromov and this dichotomy that says any statement for all countable groups is either trivial or false. So I think this is a good guiding philosophy. The spirit behind this is um, if we're just saying something for all groups, we're really just saying this is a statement that's a consequence of the group axioms, um, which is not really much material to get theory going. So there are some statements that are true for all groups things like Cayley's theorem saying we can embed any group into a symmetric group. And that's something that's really basic that we would prove in a first group theory course. But beyond these really uh, trivial statements, anything that you claim to be true for all uh, countable groups say is actually false. Either there's some really easy proof or there's some counterexample somewhere. Okay. So of course this, um, is something that we can't take too literally. And there are known uh, counterexamples to this meta theorem, if you like. Um, so, yeah, we have to take it with a grain of salt. Here are some specific counterexamples to the meta theorem. 
um, which I've taken from uh, examples that are um, about group rings. So first is that if we take a non-trivial item potent in a complex group ring, um, here I'm not assuming that G is torsion-free, then it's trace, um, which is the coefficient of the identity element, um, which also coincides with the uh, sort of operator theoretic trace. That is a real number between zero and one. That was proved by Kaplansky. Um, and in fact, it's a rational number as proved by Zaleski. So this is something that's just true with no um, conditions on the group G at all. And a similar example, uh, but now for torsion-free groups, um, is due to Connell. So if we take some group ring of a torsion-free group, then it's prime in this ring theoretic sense, which spelled out means that if I have some elements A and B in the group ring such that every single product of the form ARB for any element R from the group ring is always zero, that's only possible if one of A or B is zero itself. Um, by the way, do ask questions. I'm very happy to receive questions. Oh, okay. Just one, one comment, which is that yes. uh, the first statement that the trace is in zero one, I mean, that can be considered as a trivial statement. Okay. But not the second, not that it is a rational number. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, so in fact, um, um, I, I've heard that um, Kromov was confronted with this counterexample to his meta theorem, theorem specifically with the, the result of Zaleski, and that his response was, it's not a statement about groups, it's a statement about fields. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, what, what kind of ways? <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So, um, right, the, the, the theorem of Kaplansky, um, trivial or not, certainly has an, an interesting consequence um, that I'd like to spell out now, namely um, that the complex group algebra is von Neumann finite, or alternatively, uh, sometimes called directly finite, in the sense that every left invertible element is also right invertible. So if the product AB is one, then BA is also one. Okay, and that's just because if BA were not one, then it would be a non-trivial item potent. It's item potent because when we square it, we have AB in the middle, um, which we replace with one. And it has trace one because, um, because of the trace identity, it has the same trace as AB. Okay. So this is uh, something that we get quite easily for complex group rings. If we work in positive characteristics though, this is now something that's open. Um, uh, carries the name sometimes, say, Kaplansky's direct finiteness conjecture. Um, so it's open in general, but it's known to hold for Sophic groups. Um, so this connection with Sophic groups is really the reason why I, I got interested in these questions in the first place. Um, it's, it's a conjecture that carries Kaplansky's name, but I would argue that it's somehow of a very different flavor to the other three because we don't have this requirement that the group be torsion-free anymore. Somehow this makes it have a very different flavor, even though uh, for, for torsion-free groups, this uh, question is weaker than the item potent conjecture. Okay, so I said that um, the, these Kaplansky conjectures are strengthenings of the item potent conjecture. And in fact, for each individual group ring, we have these implications that the unit conjecture is strongest. It implies a zero divisor conjecture, which then implies the item potent conjecture. And I just want to emphasize that this really is for each individual group ring. It's not one of these statements of the form. If you could prove the conjecture in absolute all generality, then 
this other conjecture in absolute generality would be true. It's really, you, you get it in each individual case. Okay. So the zero divisor conjecture implies the item potent conjecture is completely trivial. It doesn't have anything to do with groups. Um, it's just the fact that every non-trivial item burden is itself um, a zero divisor, non-zero. So the fact that the item burden is non-trivial tells me exactly that when I multiply x by x minus one, uh, I'm multiplying two non-zero things together to get zero. Okay. To deduce the zero divisor conjecture from the unit conjecture is a little more subtle. Um, but we follow the same sort of contrapositive strategy. We take a zero divisor and turn it into a, a non-trivial unit. Um, so how does that work? Um, suppose that we have our zero divisor a times b equals zero for some non-zero a and b. Because we know the group ring is prime, this is um, the theorem of Connell from a previous slide which sort of um, runs against Gromov's meta theorem. Um, that tells me precisely that there's some element of the group ring C such that the product BCA is non-zero. Um, but now this product BCA is nil potent. In fact, it squares to zero um, just because when we power it up, we suddenly have A and B next to each other again and they multiply to give zero. Okay. So, the difference of two squares identity tells me I can you know, just um, multiply one plus BCA and one minus BCA and, and get one. So we have units and a quick little thought checks that these really have to be non-trivial units. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated and characteristic too, but it's not difficult still. Um, so multiple times at this point, um, I've been asked what happens when the group is abelian. Okay. Um, it looks something looks a little fishy if the group is abelian because um, I'm saying that I have this element C such that BCA is non-zero. Um, but if the group's abelian, then um, so is the group ring. So BCA should be equal to say ABC, which would be zero. Okay. So the resolution of this apparent uh, contradiction is, I mean, it really is a consequence of this primality theorem that the zero divisor conjecture has to be true for abelian groups. But this is something that's easy to prove on its own anyway. Okay, so yeah, just preempting if someone were to ask that question. Yeah, so, um, so that's that. This is how the, the conjectures relate to each other. The unit conjecture is stronger and indeed now we know strictly stronger. Okay. So uh, the reason we know it's strictly stronger is that we actually have a counterexample and we know that this counterexample satisfies the zero divisor conjecture. Um, so the nice thing is that it's completely explicit and it's small enough that you can really check everything by hand. Um, it's still, you know, it's a counterexample which is difficult to cook up and very intricate, but you know, once you're given it, verifying that it's really a counterexample is straightforward. Um, so uh, the thing that's perhaps most amazing with this counterexample is that it's not involving um, some sort of crazy complicated group. It's really one of the most mild groups you could imagine. It's virtually abelian, meaning that it has a finite index subgroup that's abelian. Um, so up to this small little twisting coming in from this finite index business, it's you know essentially as, as nice an infinite group as we could possibly have. I would certainly say that the, the easiest infinite groups to understand are the, the free abelian groups. Okay. So um, statement of the theorem, let P be this, um, the group given by this presentation, which is torsion free and virtually abelian. Um, so for convenience, um, you know, I define X, Y, and Z, they're actually the generators of 
a free abelian subgroup of finite index. Okay, then we can just define the Laurent polynomials in X, Y, and Z. PQR is such that this sum is a non-trivial unit. So this is something that's supported on 21 group elements. Um, and this is a non-trivial unit over the uh, field of characteristic, sorry, the, the field of order two. Don't, don't go too fast. So, so you have a, um, so there is a Z3, you mean inside, which is a free abelian group of, of uh, rank three. And then it is extended by uh, uh, what is the, 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 the extension? What is the finite group that you get? It's a diagonal group. What, what, what is it? It's um, the Klein four group, direct sum of two copies of Z mod two. Oh, it's simply two copies of Z2. So it's very, very simple. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, really this is somehow the simplest thing that could possibly work, uh, a very, very mild group. Um, right. And so because the quotient is order four, um, you know, every element, um, in this group is in one of four different cosets of the uh, Z cube subgroup and you know, these four polynomials PQRS are just sort of spelling out how my element of the group ring is divided into these four different cosets. Um, yeah, so there's, so one A, B and A, B are my um, transversal. Okay. Yeah, so part of what makes this example work is um, uh, sort of it exhibits a lot of symmetry. Um, so these polynomials have um, some symmetry, which will be apparent on the next slide. And in fact, the inverse is also um, you know, put together out of the same pieces, assembled in a somewhat slightly different way. So we've got different shifts and um, sort of rotations coming in by this action. Um, um, may have made no sense, but uh, I guess you can you can read from what the uh, the line saying what the inverse is that certainly the inverse is very strongly related to this element itself. Okay, and it, it only takes a few pages to verify. I, I can tell you that I checked it with my computer and it works. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so certainly um, uh, I, I would say that the, the safest option is to check by a computer, but I know that there um, uh, people who are skeptical, so I certainly wanted to include the by hand computation in the paper. Yeah, sure. yeah. Um, and so in the time since my paper first went on the archive, um, this construction was generalized by Alan Murray to work for any positive characteristic, um, exploiting some sort of clever identity. Somehow I uh, believe he he, he found a unit that worked for F3 and sort of saw a pattern that could be generalized. Uh, so group, what are the groups that he uses with respect to your group? Is it the it, same it's, group? It's the exact same group. Oh, the same group. It's, okay, wow. Well, yes. I see. Mm -hmm. um, so if we think back to the sort of um, model yeah. theoretic right. stuff yeah. I was saying, yes. yeah. um, one might hope that this would settle the question for characteristic zero. But the point is that um, the supports of these uh -huh. elements in the group ring grow without bound. I see, okay, <laughs> too bad. <I> see. <laughs> so, so sadly, this doesn't settle the question about characteristic zero, but it certainly settles another question um, which was presenting itself after my counterexample, namely, maybe my counterexample is something, I mean, maybe, the failure of the conjecture at all only works in characteristic two, uh -huh. in which case one could still hope to prove it for all odd characteristic and thereby mm -hmm. prove it for C. Um, so this strategy to prove it over C is certainly ruled out. That's the one conclusive thing we can say. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, Oh, wait, wait a second. I mean, when you say that, I mean, is there a lower bound on the size of the support for when you take uh, large primes? Um, in in Mari's example, I believe the support grows without bound. 
grosse souris. It, it goes to infinity. No, no, I know, but uh, what I mean is that can one give a lower bound of the size of the spectrum in this case? Um, uh, to, to say that um, any possible counterexample, right. not just Murray's. Right, yeah. Um, no, no, I mean for, for this group, of course, for the fixed group, uh, of course. Yeah. I, I think that would be quite difficult. So mm -hmm. trying to understand all of the units in the group ring seems mm -hmm. rather intractable. I, I wouldn't be too surprised if it turned out that, say, for F2, um, my unit has support of size 21. I wouldn't be too surprised if 21 was the best possible. But I have no idea how one, how one would yeah. try and prove that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So what does this look like? sort of a bit geometrically. Um, okay, so here I try and say a little bit about what, what this group is. Um, so it sometimes carries the name Hunch event. They studied um, a corresponding flat three manifold, which has this group as its fundamental group uh, back in the 30s. Um, so it's a crystallographic group, a virtually abelian group. Um, this is something quite classical. And the thing that distinguishes it amongst all three-dimensional crystallographic groups is it's the only torsion-free one um, which has finite abelianization, or equivalently uh, first Betty number zero, um, which is uh, in fact necessary uh, in order to be a, a counterexample to this conjecture. So it really is sort of the, not only is it virtually abelian, it's sort of certainly definitely the the easiest virtually abelian group that could possibly work. Um, so it's group theoretic structure is it has this normal Z cubes generated by um, the squares, so A squared, B squared, and AB squared, which I call X, Y, Z. And the quotient is this Klein four group. Um, so whenever we have such a crystallographic group, it comes with um, uh, an action, uh, an isometric action on three space. And as long as we pick the right action, then we can derive this nice little picture, which really um, sort of shows the symmetry that these polynomials exhibit nicely. So, um, so the color coding represents which polynomial some element of the support is in, which is the same as saying which coset of the um, Z cube subgroup we're in. And it's sort of, I guess I should have labeled the axes, but they're sort of, you know, uh, X going roughly to the right, Y going back and Z going up. And so for example, this product one plus X times one plus Y times uh, one plus Z inverse, that is P. And this just gives me this um, blue cube. Okay, so, so I, I guess I haven't really explained how I get the points. I mean, really I'm just taking my fixed action, and then I take some base point in R3, and I ask for each group element, where does that group element send the base point? And then I'll identify the group element with that point in three space. Okay, so um, yeah, so these polynomials really just are saying, how do I move about by translations in three space? Um, that Z cube is just acting by translation. And the extra Klein four group is the rotational part. Okay. So I hope that makes some sense, but I, I understand that it's a bit uh, a bit much to try and squeeze in on one slide. Can you can you visualize the F2 coefficients in, in, in a similar way or um so um so Everything's either a zero or one, and I'm just drawing the things which are. I understand. Uh, but so, so it's just subsets, you mean, of uh, of the things that you look at. I mean, whether when you take coefficients in F two, I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so now I'm just saying, what are these things with? Uh, yeah, thinking of them as sets. Yeah. Sorry, that I should have made that clear. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, that's a nice thing about working over F2, everything's uh, somehow I can just think in terms of sets, uh, making such a visualization. Okay, right. And um, you know, in trying to sort of explain what makes this example tick, uh, in my paper, I have a lemma sort of saying how sort of a general criterion to produce units in this group. And one constraint is a type of symmetry, which is exactly the fact that if you draw the Z axis going vertically in the middle of this picture, you have rotational symmetry by, by 180 about that axis. Yeah. Okay. So I certainly don't know what all the group, uh, what all the units for this group ring are. Um, I know some enough to say some things about the group of units, but certainly trying to understand the full group of units seems quite intractable. So if the unit conjecture were true, it would say that the group of units would be just the group of units at the field times the group itself. And okay, in this case, my K is just F2. So it's group of units is the trivial group. So if the unit conjecture were true for this group, then its group of units would be isomorphic to the group and itself would be some very mild, small group. It would be finitely generated and virtually abelian as well. But in fact, this fails in a, in a very strong way because the group of units, okay, it's still um, nice in the sense of being torsion-free and linear, but it's not finitely generated and it contains non-abelian free subgroups. So in many senses, I would say this is the full group of units is quite huge. So arguing that we have that the group of units is this big is actually not too difficult. We just need a few little tricks. The first is that we can turn the example I gave into um, a whole family of units, which we can basically think of as being like some sort of rescaling of our coordinates in in three space, say, if, we've, if we want to think more geometrically. Um, so that's not too difficult, we, um, but we can just sort of rescale things um, in some sense, such that we get new units which are modeled on the same unit. Yeah, the same, you know, we still have 21 units in the support, but they've somehow been stretched out in three space. Okay. So this turns it into an infinite family. And we can then make a comparison with the infinite dihedral group. So Mirovich calculated the full group of units for um, the grouping of the infinite dihedral group over F2. Um, so this is now sufficiently easy. You know, it's only an index two. You know, it's an extension of Z by Z mod two. So two is much smaller than four and z to the one is much simpler than z to the three. This group is sufficiently easy that we can really find all of its units and give a nice algebraic description of that group of units. And that's this quite large group that I've written down here. So we have um, an infinite free product of infinite direct products of z mod two. And then this is acted on by the group of trivial units, which acts in a sort of natural way on the z of the, the free product. Anyway, the point is that that group's not finitely generated because we can retract it onto um, one of the uh, free factors. So some infinite direct sum of Z mod twos. And under the map, so there is a map, in fact, a few different maps from the group P onto the infinite dihedral group, which then induces a map from its units to the units of the dihedral group, and that hits, you know, under this retraction, um, an infinite sum of Z mod twos. So that's how we know that it's um, not finally generated. And similarly, we can see that we have things showing up in different free factors, giving us the fact that we have free subgroups. Okay. Yeah, so I would just like to emphasize that this group is really very mild. I think that it's the really surprising thing about the end of the, the story of the unit conjecture is that the counterexample is not a crazy group. It's a really nice group that's only 
index four away from being Z cubed. So except for the fact that it's a counterexample, it is conjecture, it's, it's very nice in many, many senses. For example, it satisfies the zero divisor conjecture. And this was shown by Kenny Brown um, in characteristic zero and by Cliff in general. And because it satisfies the Farrell Jones conjecture, uh, if you know what that is, it's a conjecture in algebraic K theory, it tells us that there's a corresponding whitehead group, um, which is trivial. So the whitehead group, if one just says whitehead group is taken with Z coefficients, but we can uh, make sense of it with other ring coefficients. Uh, and the triviality of this whitehead group tells us that our units are in a sense stably trivial. So we can trivialize them in something um, sort of bigger than the group ring. Namely, we can take matrices over the group ring and see our unit as a one by one matrix. And then we can embed that in some larger um, GL by taking a block sum with something identity. And you know, up to you know, after applying elementary row and column operations, we can turn that into a trivial unit. So, so in a sense, for topological applications, this is maybe the more, more relevant question than the unit conjecture. And this is certainly true. So we can say you know, this counterexample is something that only works unstably in some sense. So given that the group is so mild, maybe we'd be asking why would one try to use it to disprove the conjecture at all? Well. Certainly, this is a very old idea that this group could be a counterexample to the conjecture. It's not uh, anything that I can claim. Um, this group's been sort of on the radar as, as a somewhat unusual group for a very long time. And the reason why I took it to you know, try and cook up this counterexample is that there's actually a very naive property which implies the unit conjecture that is actually satisfied, well, is maybe not satisfied by such a huge array of groups, but certainly the groups that are known not to have this naive property is very small. P is one of them. So now I'll say something about this naive property, which is called the unique product property, and also some sort of how these conjectures connect to various other questions. So um, these Kaplansky conjectures, you know, all three of them, um, are sort of big statements that apparently apply to all torsion-free groups. And we can conclude them from other big statements, which um, at least potentially are true for all groups or all torsion-free groups. Um, okay, so big conjectures which are open in general, um, the ATE conjecture on integrality of uh, L2 Petty numbers, Baumcon conjecture and Fowler-Jones conjecture, these respectively give us the zero divisor conjecture or item put in conjecture over C. So you know, these are known for very large classes of groups. And as a result, we get the corresponding conje Kaplansky conjectures for large numbers of groups. But the unit conjecture sort of sticks out as being very different in that we only know it as a consequence of this unique product property, which is something in a sense that's very naive. So now, despite many attempts, no one was ever able to prove that the unit conjecture is a consequence of some big analytic or K-theoretic machine. Okay, so what's the unique product property? It sort of does what it says on the tin. It says that if I take any finite subsets of the group, A and B, then there's always some element in that product set, which is uniquely expressible as such a product. So there's some element of the group, which can only be written as A times B for unique A and A and B and B. Okay, so it's immediately obvious that this property implies the zero divisor conjecture, because if I had zero divisors and I took their supports, called those the sets A and B, and used this unique product property, I'd then see that there's some element in their product whose support is just, you know, the product of, um, you know, some field element from one grouping element times another field element. And that's it. There's no possibility for cancellation. So the unique product property immediately gives the zero divisor conjecture. And in fact, there's a nice little lemma by Stranowski from 1980, 
which says that something that's a priori stronger is actually equivalent to the unique product property, namely the so-called two unique product property, which says that we have the same thing, um, but we have two elements that are uniquely expressible, provided that A and B are not both singletons. Okay, so somehow everything we know that's positive about the unit conjecture feeds through this unique product property. Um, yeah, and, and just a remark, um, the zero divisor conjecture is actually known for all elementary amenable groups for any field. Uh, this is a paper of Kropola, Linnell, and Moody, which comes sort of at the end of a long sequence of papers proving the zero divisor conjecture for larger and larger classes of elementary amenable groups. It's maybe worth emphasizing that this is, um, you know, it's, it's a K-theoretic result, and this is really only true for elementary amenable groups, which are an algebraic class of groups. This is not something that we know for all amenable groups, um, right? Which would then be, say, a more geometric or analytic statement. And in fact, um, for amenable groups, the zero divisor conjecture is equivalent to the ATA conjecture. So um, just to con convince you that some large numbers of groups satisfy unique products, the unique product property, um, a very easy lemma um, from Botomura Ramtula is that groups which are left orderable have this unique product property. So a group is left orderable if it admits a total order. So I can say which elements are smaller than each other uh, for the whole group that is invariant under left multiplication. So um, this is quite a large class of groups, includes say free groups, torsion free nilpotence groups, torsion free one related groups, even some more unusual groups like Thompson's group F. In fact, this left orderability is equivalent to admitting a free action by homeomorphisms on the line um, orientation preserving. Okay, so um, proof of this lemma is really easy, but I, I won't actually go through it since I guess my time's running up a little bit. Um, so it turns out that you know, finding groups which don't have these unique product properties is kind of difficult. Um, there's some large classes of groups that are known to have it, and then for groups where we don't know the answer, it's very difficult to actually prove that those groups don't have the property. So um, the concept was just like the conjectures themselves buried in Hickman's thesis and then sort of reintroduced in the literature by Rudin and Schneider in, in 64. And it took two decades until the first example came out of a torsion-free group that doesn't have this unique product property. And that was Rips and Segev using small cancellation theory. So this is quite a complicated involved argument that ends up sort of arguing about the existence of groups with very large presentations such that the relations have small overlap um, is sort of therefore something that's kind of difficult to work with if we want to do things concretely. But luckily for me, in the following year, Promislov realized that in fact this group P, this hunch of end group, virtually abelian group, um, is a non-unique product group. And in fact, it has a 14 element set um, whose square has no unique product. So- Is this 14 element set related to your construction? Um, I think not really. Um, not really. I mean- so. so it's known that that 14 element set doesn't support a non-trivial unit for any oh, field. Okay, I see, I see. This I is see. proved by Craven and Pappas. I see. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's the reason why I, I suspect that maybe 21 is, is minimal. But, yeah, I see. But um, I don't have any idea how to prove that. Um, yeah, so if we want to disprove any of these conjectures, we need non-unique product groups. Unique product property implies the unit conjecture, which is the strongest of, of the three conjectures. And I think on this slide, I have all of the examples that are in the literature. And they all come in one of two flavors. 
sort of following on in the tradition of the examples from the 80s. So there are those ones which are in which are small cancellation groups. Um, so pioneered by Rip Segev and then continued by Steinbock and his co-authors. And then there are examples modeled on what Promislav did where we have a, a concrete group that we really understand and we can sort of work concretely with it and produce the failure of unique products. So Carter found a way to generalize um, the group of Promislav into a whole family of groups um, and all the higher ones um, are non amenable they have three subgroups so they really are quite, quite different um, an example of uh, Lindsay Solberg from her master's thesis I mean so she went about trying to find like um, sort of minimal ways that we could have unique product property fail by thinking of how you know we can actually get small sets with all the products pairing up you know, for each failure of the unique product property you could write down a presentation of some corresponding universal group and so thesis has sort of the world record if you like where we have um two eight element sets whose product doesn't have i, I, I presume that your, your notation p is for promise love um yes yeah okay. uh, i i think i may have copied that from carter um I see. yeah <laughs> Yeah, I had to pick some letter and you know, writing HW all the time would be a bit annoying. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the first flavor, the small cancellation groups, they're difficult to try and work with concretely um, because the presentations are, are really big. And these ones of the second flavor are actually all known to satisfy the zero divisor conjecture for one reason or another. In Solberg's example is elementary immutable. And Carter's examples, there's an argument involving a structure as, a, as an amalgam. Okay, so question is what comes next? Is there any hope that we could try and disprove other Kaplansky conjectures given that you know, the unit conjecture somehow worked with this very mild group which has no chance of doing anything for the other conjectures? Um, or if we want an explicit counterexample to the zero divisor conjecture, then we certainly need new not any product groups because the ones on the previous slide aren't going to cut it for a direct computational approach. So there's something I've been thinking about quite a lot, of course, and at least I can report that there's one group for which I know that it doesn't have the unique product property, um, but for which at least if it satisfies a zero divisor conjecture, that would be news to me. Um, so yeah, I, I've given the presentation of the group here. This is not really the best way to think about the group, but I just want to emphasize the point that it's something um, explicit that you can write down and the presentation is not um, too ginormous. Um, uh, is it a Gromov hyperbolic group? It's cat zero, but has uh, Z squared subgroups. Uh, so it's sort of non-positively curved, but not Gromov hyperbolic. It's not Gromov hyperbolic. Yeah. Um, so in case there's anyone in the audience is um, familiar with buildings in, in the sense of buildings, it's an A2 tilde lattice. And this in particular implies that it has property T. Yeah, yeah. I think property T is maybe something to look for if we want to find counterexamples which are concrete um, because, um, well, as far as we know, property T groups tend to be non-orderable probably a lot of them don't have the unique product property. And certainly a lot of the tools that we have to try and prove these conjectures don't work for um, at least lots of property T groups. So we certainly uh, won't have immutability and say a lot of the ways we have to prove the Atiyah conjecture, for example, um, don't work for property T groups. Yeah, I mean, the, the reason why I was mentioning the Gromov hypermoly group is that, you know, as you know, the uh, uh, Vincent Laforgue proved that uh, they satisfy the bound cons conjecture, all of them. Yes. So, I mean, they, they wouldn't be a, a good case to look at, but uh, okay. But I mean, yeah. it, so this is this is something which is look, looking more like SL3 or something like that. Huh? Yes. And yeah. it is um, realizable as a matrix group in positive characteristic. I yeah. think maybe even three dimensional. Um, but, yeah, okay. Good. but, but, um, 
being a cat zero group, this does satisfy the Farrell Jones conjecture. So at least over C, the item potent conjecture is certainly true for this group. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, in, in fact, for any characteristic, uh, because it's uh, sophic. Yeah. Okay. So that's sort of um, all I can say on what look, what are the prospects to try and um, disprove other Kaplansky conjectures. Um, I just finished by emphasizing some questions which are still open about the unit conjecture. Namely, is it ever true for a group when we don't have the unique product property? I think that this group P was thought of as a good group to try and prove the unit conjecture for without the unique product property. Um, Craven and Pappas have a long paper working towards this. Um, of course, we now know that um, one can't possibly see that goal to fruition, but are there any other examples? Or do we have to entertain this idea that maybe the conjecture and the unique product property are equivalent? And this would be, this sounds very crazy, but I guess uh, until we see an example answering this question, um, then who knows? And of course, uh, it would still be very nice to produce units in characteristic zero and sort of most satisfying, of course, would be to do it um, in the integral group ring, which I think especially for um, topology is really the, the most natural uh, group ring to think about. Okay, so uh, I'll finish there and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any any questions? Well, yes, I, I I'm quite curious about the computer the calculations in your in your talk in CIMEC. Can you can you give us some 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 idea about this? I mean, um. Uh, I guess I don't want to go too far into it, but I guess the, the key thing is, I guess, um, translating into a different problem. Uh -huh. um, I see. Yeah. You mean, but then using the computer to, 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 to solve it or? Yes. Yeah. yeah sure, um, sure. I mean, it's, it's very dependent on computation. Yeah. Yeah. It's very dependent on computations. Yes. Mm. Does the last group that you described act co-compactly on the eight into the building? Is yes. Okay. So, sorry. So, I, so then, I the um, con at least would be true for it, thanks to other work of Lefwick. Ah, I was not aware of that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, w which paper is that? So it, it follows from his his opus, together with uh, the fact that these groups have the rapid decay property. And that's a result of Steger and Robertson and uh, Ramage, which is cited in, in Vincent's papers. So I think if you look in the um, bibliography of Vincent's papers, you'll see the references. Okay, thanks. Any more questions, comment? Well, one comment, which is, it seems from, you know, that uh, this, these conjectures are of very, very different nature. I mean, the, the unit conjecture and the idempotent conjecture, I mean, they are, they are really quite different. I mean, the zero divisor conjecture. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, um, so indeed, I mean, it's, uh, it's quite amazing indeed that this group is so, I mean, it's almost a billion, and uh, and yet, you know, <laughs> yeah. this is, uh, construction which works. So it's I, I I think you were saying, you know, the, what are the um, units in C of P? I mean, that's probably a very very important question to resolve. I mean, uh, whether over C, uh, and but of course there it's much more difficult to use a computer, I guess. But still, okay, might be you know there is a way which is more topological and so on, which one can kind of approach things that would be units and um, and then use some some argument to get closer and closer. I don't know. I mean, but that seems to be a very, very 
accessible um, extension of what you did and to, to try to do it uh, not using finite fields because that's okay, that's kind of, no, I mean, it gives the idea, but, yeah. um, but uh, indeed, uh, I mean, but when you are using finite fields, of course, I mean, this, this was just the fact that you, were, you had an algebraic closed field which had the right cardinality, so the, then which had characteristic zero, of course, that was it. Then you knew that it was isomorphic to C. So, I mean, yeah. yeah. So that was it. But, um, okay, one might think also of using perhaps, you know, this field um, which are obtained from the PADX and uh, taking the algebraic closure and so on, trying to work, for instance, over uh, Q2 uh, with your example right. with F2. And, uh, yes. So, so, so I, I guess to, to answer various points, I mean, I, I think it's, fair enough to say that working over finite fields is cheating in a sense and it would be really nice to do it over C. Um, yeah. Certainly there are there are you know tools for doing um, computational algebraic geometry and to solve these systems of, of polynomial equations but yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess so you, Grobner basis techniques these really sort of have exponential blow up so sure, sure. Unless, yeah, yeah, unless we have something yeah. that's very very small I, um, that's certainly difficult and uh, on the two addicts i mean i did really think about oh you thought i try and... yes i see okay good yeah I, yeah I because think... the obvious thing to do would be to extend your result by replacing f2 by a finite you know by a z mod 2 to power, to power n as a, as a ring take that as coefficients and see if you if your counter example survives when you take uh, um, I power of two. I mean, you know. Yes. So, so I did actually try this. And, you tried that. Okay. I see. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't really have anything conclusive to say, but my feeling was that. Um, so if I if I fix the support and say I only want things where the unit and its inverse are supported on these twenty one elements, at some point we get stuck and we we can't lift it anymore. I can't remember. Maybe this is that mod eight or something. Cannot lift it anymore. But I see. I see. It, if we allow ourselves to grow the support, then maybe we can lift, but then we get stuck in this game where I think if you allow yourself to grow the support, you can always just... I understand, but then probably a finer study with a lot of computer power could help for that because then you know you, you could see whether you are really stuck or there is something you were missing or something like that. Yeah. So, so my guess would be if you're willing to grow the support, you can probably always lift further and further, but your you need to support growing so you won't get something in 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 Z2. Your, um, yeah. 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 Because this seems to be the best way to access uh, characteristic zero. I mean, which is the VIT construction essentially. I mean Maybe one should think more in terms of the VIT construction rather than in Z modulo two to the power n, because the, the VIT, um, the, you have the type mirror lifts and you have the VIT construction, which is much more efficient than the, the usual way to approach the, um, the extensions. So maybe you can try that. I mean, you know, using the VIT polynomials to, to access to the, um, to the two. It's a very different way of accessing to Z2 because the Dyke Miller leaves, they don't have uh, any finite support. I mean, they go to infinity. But they satisfy beautiful rules, algebraic rules, which fit very well with the group ring, much better than the extension uh, that we were talking about. Thanks. I'll look into that. Your muted Katya. Katya? Uh, you, your microphone is cut. Katya, we cannot hear you. I'm sorry, yeah, I was uh, mute myself. <laughs> <laughs> I was muting myself. <laughs> no problem with the with the communication. Uh, I was wondering uh, if there is any more uh, comment. Uh, 
uh, or uh, any question in the chat, but I don't see. Uh, so if not, uh, thanks, Gilles, again for the very interesting talk. Thank you.